Ladies Church. Today I want to talk about love. Uh, I think it would be good for us to reflect a little bit on uh, the greatest commandment as Jesus uh, identified it for us. I wonder if, if Jesus hadn't told us, if we didn't have that conversation recorded for us in the Gospels where someone asked him the question, what's the greatest commandment in the law? I wonder, as we read through uh, the books of Moses, what would we have identified as the greatest commandment uh, in the law? During Jesus' own day, the Jews were debating that very question. And some folks had come to the right answer, the, the same answer that Jesus gave, at least partially. Uh, you'll remember well that Jesus actually gave two commands. That too was not necessarily unusual in his day. Other Jewish rabbis had, would identify a combination of commandments to sum up and uh, give the heart of the Mosaic Law. Uh, but uh, no one combined the two commands that Jesus combined from the Mosaic Law. Uh, he points first to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse five, verses 5 and 6. Uh, and I want to spend some time looking at that verse as it's presented to us in uh, the Mosaic Law itself and try to uh, glean from it some, some pieces of what it means. Uh, we know we could summarize pretty simply Jesus' understanding here and Jesus' teaching on this point. The greatest commandment uh, breaks down into two, love God and love your neighbor. But Jesus, in both cases, goes further than simply saying those two things, love God and love your neighbor. He goes on to say how we are to love God and how we are to love our neighbor. And he doesn't elaborate or add anything to what we find in the Mosaic Law. He simply quotes what's there. Uh, interestingly, he doesn't quote from the Ten Commandments that we often elevate as though they are more important than uh, other parts of the Mosaic Law. He points to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, which had become uh, somewhat of a fundamental confession for the nation of Israel, for the people of Israel, as far as their understanding of who they were as God's people and who God is and what their uh, prime responsibility in their relationship with God was. So let me read these words and make some comments about uh, the nature of this commandment in Hebrew and what is going on here with this interesting command. And then we'll look at the way that Jesus quotes it in Mark's Gospel especially, and we'll see some interesting uh, development there that will help us understand what's going on. Uh, and before I read the text and get into this more in depth, I think this is important because we right now really need to uh, orient our lives around what's most important. Uh, it's easy in a time when life is outside of its routine, uh, when we're faced with uh, new dangers and new threats uh, uh, in a season of pandemic, in particular when illness is on the rise, uh, and also when uh, governmental regulations are changing and our society around us is changing, uh, whether for good or for ill, it's important for us as believers in Jesus to re- orient our lives around what the scriptures give us as mo most important, because those things don't change. Our number one priorities in life as followers of Jesus do not change. And if we could keep those in focus, if we could keep our priorities in biblical uh, framework, then I think we can respond well to the changes that are happening around us, uh, even if we don't like those changes even if we struggle with those changes and we would like for things to be much different than they are, if we can keep the main thing the main thing, then we can find ourselves responding according to the way Jesus would have us respond, uh, rather than get bent out of shape or get frustrated or dip ourselves into complaining. So let's look again at these greatest commandments. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, uh, verse 4. 5 and 6 is where we'll focus here. Uh, just verse 5. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God. You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Love Yahweh your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your might. So 
the love command here is given three aspects, three elements. All your heart, all your soul, and all your might is the way our English Bibles tend to translate uh, these ideas. Now what's going on in this great commandment, this greatest of all commandments, uh, is really quite simple, uh, but we need to think it through in its pieces before we come to understanding what its point, its main point is. Uh, so, the idea of love, we should start there. The Hebrew uh, verb for love is ahav, ahav, and it is not so much an emotional term, it does have an affection component to it, but love in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, primarily, uh, these major words for love, refer to uh, a certain commitment to be in a relationship with someone. And so there's this aspect of commitment, there's this aspect of uh, my will being engaged, that I choose to be committed to and connected to this particular person. And so to the command here is love your God. That's not about how you feel about God, that is rather about your commitment to Him, that you will value him, and you will be committed to him and his values above your own. It does take on this selflessness attitude. To love another person is to put his concerns above your own concerns, to put his, his values above your own values, and what he thinks is more important than what you think. And so it really is an element of submission. I submit myself and I humble myself so that uh, Yahweh, in this case, God, the one true God, is more important than I am. He's more valuable than I am. What He wants for my life is more important than what I want for my life. And so this fundamental commandment of loving God has to do with orienting my perspective, orienting my priorities underneath and around what God says is important and what God says is valuable. And of course, he himself is the most important. He himself is the most valuable uh, entity and being in the universe. And so it is a, a great act of grace and love from his point to command us to love him above all else. Uh, to devote ourselves to Him and to commit ourselves to Him is uh, not only calling for the, the deepest and the most uh, sturdy commitment that we can experience in life, but it is also a great act of love toward us, uh, for God to reveal Himself to us in such a way that we can respond to Him as the most valuable the most important uh, being, the most important person in the universe. And to call us into a relationship with Him is a wondrous thing indeed, a great gift, the greatest of all gifts, to be sure. So this commandment is not uh, burdensome. This commandment to love God is uh, fundamentally for our good. It's the best way to live. It's the only way to live the good life. But then the... Uh, the commandment is fleshed out. There's some how given to this. We must love Him in a certain way. We must love God in a certain way. And He gives three aspects. With all your heart. Notice the all. All your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And so this is all-encompassing. Uh, this is not half-hearted. This is whole-hearted. This is whole-personed. Uh, this calls for all that we are. And that's really where we're going here with this. Now you might see the, the uh, target up here, the circles. Forgive my inability to draw a circle well, uh, but this is, uh, this is the best I can do. Uh, so what's going on, it seems, from the way the commandment is given in Hebrew, is you have actually uh, a, a concentric circles here, where we start with the most fundamental part of our identity of our person as the heart, right there in the center of who we are as human beings. The heart in Hebrew, we'll come back to specifically what that is referring to in just a minute because it's important to identify that uh, in distinction from these other pieces. Because he says the three, these three aspects, 
And there's uh, distinctions between them, and it's important for us to observe them. So he starts with the very core of who we are, referring to the heart. Uh, and then he moves outward from the heart, and he refers to what our English Bibles refer to as soul. Now I'm going to come back to that in just a second and kind of qualify what's going on there, because when we use the word soul in English, we have some poor associations with that term that don't actually apply most of the time in the Bible. It does occasionally. We tend to think of soul, when we use that word in English, we tend to think of the immaterial part of ourselves, the, the spiritual as opposed to the physical. But the Hebrew word does not necessarily mean that. It, in certain contexts, it does refer to that. But most of the time, and in this context, pretty, uh, I'm pretty sure it refers to much more than simply what we mean when we say the word soul. So I'm going to quantify that, qualify that in just a second. And then finally, he uses the word strength. Uh, that's how our English Bibles translate this last term. Uh, and so strength is a broader term that kind of gets outside of ourselves. Now, the Hebrew is very nuanced in, in understanding here what is going on. And so I want to talk about that for just a minute. The Hebrew word for heart literally and physically does refer to the blood pumper, the blood pumping organ in our bodies. And so it can have the same reference that we think about in English. But at that point... We have to start thinking differently when we read our Bible, particularly in the Old Testament. And so this is one case where the word heart, when you see it in the Old Testament, is going to have a slightly different nuance than when you read about it in the New Testament. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But heart in Hebrew, it does refer to the blood pumping organ physically and literally and fundamentally. But when it starts talking about uh, metaphorically speaking... It refers to uh, some aspects of our personality that we need to think about. But we need to contrast that with the way we tend to use the word heart in English. We might say, I love you with all my heart. Uh, or we, uh, you know, we send Valentine's cards and they've got little pictures of this pink heart shape. Uh, and it's expressing this feeling and this emotion of love that we tend to associate with the heart. When we say someone has, a, has uh, someone loves with all their heart, we're talking about an emotion. We're talking about feelings. Uh, or we might also say that that person has a lot of heart. And by that we mean they have courage, they're brave, and they have the ability to overcome obstacles. And so there's this aspect where we're thinking about courage or bravery in terms of ha having heart. So in English, we associate different things, different aspects of our personality with the blood pumping organ in our bodies. Well, in the ancient world, in Hebrew, and in surrounding uh, cultures, in Babylon, in Egypt, in Assyria, in all of those ancient cultures from the time of the nation of Israel and before, the blood pumping organ was not primarily associated with the feeling. And so already we have some kind of cultural distance between us as Western American 21st century readers, Bible readers, and the original authors of Scripture writing in different cultures with a different language, with different cultural associations. So it's important for us to ask the question, well, what do they mean when they say heart? They don't mean, typically, to refer to the emotions, to the feelings, the way that we do in modern Western American uh, uh, English. So what do, they, what do they refer to? When they think of the heart, when they think of the blood pumper, when they use it in metaphorical extension to refer to an aspect of our personality, and so that means what I'm about to say applies to typically when you read the word heart in your Old Testament, you need to be thinking in these terms. It refers to three areas primarily. Uh, it can refer just kind of non-specifically non to the core of our personality, the, the inner person or the fundamental core of our identity. So it can be generic, and sometimes it is. And you kind of have to just pay attention to context to see if there's a specific nuance being focused on, just like you do in English when you hear the word heart used. But the three aspects of our personality that the heart typically refers to in ancient Hebrew is, first of all, the intellect, or the thinker, 
what we would say in English as the mind, they would say the heart. Uh, in fact, if you read your English Old Testament, you could just do a search in a concordance or online even from an, an English Bible, and you search for the word mind in the Old Testament, you will get some hits in most English Bible translation. You'll get a few results, but in almost every case, the Hebrew word underneath mind is actually what we also what they usually translate as heart. And so the Hebrew understanding is that the blood pumper represents the core of our being, and the core of our being has to do with the way we think. Our thinking is a part of what makes us who we are. And so they associated the blood pumping organ, the heart, with the thinking processes. And so when you read about the heart in the Old Testament, very often it's talking about the way you think. It's talking about logic. It's talking about ration, rational thinking. Uh, that's not what we in America would associate with the heart. We would never go down that road, in fact. But that's the primary thrust of the heart in the Old Testament when it's used with any kind of specificity. The second aspect of the personality that's being referred to with the heart is not only the thinker, but also the chooser, the will. The will is located in the heart, in the core of a person's being. And perhaps you can, you can conceptualize how they would be associated together. You make decisions, you make choices based on what you think. Uh, typically, you're going to think through a decision that you make. And so the thinker and the chooser are tightly uh, connected in Hebrew Old Testament thinking. And so the heart represents both of them together, the thinker and the chooser. And the third aspect, occasionally, is that it does refer to affections. And so, just like we have in English, but what, what the difference is, in English, in American English, the dominant metaphorical extension for the blood-pumping organ, the heart, is the affections, or the emotions. But in Hebrew, that's actually the, a rarer uh, case for uh, the understanding of the emotions or the affections. Uh, when you start getting to, into emotions or affections, typically Hebrew refers to, instead of the blood pumping organ, it actually refers to the, the kidneys, the kidneys. And the King James Version actually preserves this uh, in English. You'll see some verses in the King James Version in the Old Testament will use the word reins, uh, reins. So R-E-I-N-S. Now, that's not a word that in, Eng in Old English, in 1611 King James English, that's not referring to uh, the, the straps that you would put on a horse to guide them along. This is where we would get the word renal, like in renal failure in medical terminology. Uh, it's a word for the kidneys in Old English. And so uh, in King James Version, sometimes the word reins is actually there in the text. Um, some of our, our more modern English Bibles, like the English Standard Version that I use, will give you a footnote. In the English text, it'll usually say the word heart. That's what's interesting. Uh, this is one of the translation issues that we have to wrestle with. Do we translate literally, so we translate the word as kidneys, or do we translate the metaphor, the imagery, so that we get the point? And the English Standard Version and almost all modern translations have chosen to use the word heart instead of kidneys because in English, in Western American and modern uh, English thinking, we have no metaphorical extended meaning for the kidneys. We don't talk that way. We don't speak of loving someone with our kidneys. We don't speak of our passions coming from our kidneys. And so we don't use that. It's not a live metaphor anymore. And so they make a choice to translate with the English word heart, even though the Hebrew is referring to a different organ. So the issue that we have in the great commandment here is the heart, not the kidneys, but the heart, the core of our thinking and our choosing primarily, but the core of our being. And so he's, he's definitely talking about the inner person, the core of who we are, what makes us who we are. So that's the heart. So love Yahweh, your God, with all of your heart, everything that you are. And so that means, as we break it down and think about well, what, does that mean on a, what does that mean on the ground, like on a real day-to-day -day basis? Well, that means we should be loving God with our thinking. 
We should be loving God with our, with our thought processes, with the way that we think. We should be expressing our commitment to our God, expressing our faithfulness to our God with the way that we think, and also with the way that we choose. The decisions that we make should seek to express love for our God. That's what loving Yahweh your God, loving the Lord your God with all your heart means. That all of your thinking and all of your choosing is to be an expression of love for God. So test yourself. Think about what you think about. Think about how you use your mind. Think about the choices that you make from day to day. Are they expressions of love for God? That's the heart of the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God. Love Yahweh your God with all your heart. Secondly, love the Lord your God with all your soul. Now, as I said earlier, this word soul in English is not super helpful. Um, it refers to, typically in English, the aspect of our personalities that is immaterial, unphysical, non-physical. And again, this Hebrew word can mean that. This Hebrew word for soul uh, is, I'll just use English letters for simplicity, nefesh, nefesh. Now, nefesh is a physical word as well in Hebrew. Nefesh literally and physically refers to the throat. It refers to the throat. There are just a handful, less than five, I think, if I remember off the top of my head, occasions in the Old Testament where nephesh is translated as throat. Uh, there's a couple that occur in Proverbs, I'm pretty sure, but uh, it literally, physically refers to the throat. And so, how do you get from throat to soul? How do you get from throat to soul? Well, <laughs> if you think about it, the idea is, what happened, what is your throat for? And if you think about it from a non-scientific, non-biological, non-modern uh, perspective, if you just think about it from an ancient perspective of just observation from the ex from the outside, what do you what what happens through your throat? Well, at one level, food goes in your throat and into your body, right? That's the pathway where food goes into your body to nourish you so that you stay alive. And so nefesh then, this Hebrew word nefesh, is really about the source of life, what makes us alive. And it has a very physical component. It is not simply immaterial or spiritual. And so soul is very misleading in our English Bibles. And some of our modern translations have gone away from translating it as soul. Uh, most of our English Bibles, like the ESV, sometimes translates it soul and sometimes they don't. Uh, because they're kind of translators are beginning to recognize that soul just doesn't work as an English equivalent in uh, Bible translation, but that's going to take some more time to uh, kind of develop to where Bible translations stop translating it with this English word that's a little bit misleading. So another thing that just based on observation that uh, the pa what else goes through the throat? Well, air does. If you breathe in and out with your mouth open, air passes th into the throat. And so the throat became viewed in a metaphorical extension as the source or pathway of life. And so many Bible translations will now translate, instead of soul, they'll actually translate with the word life. Now again, uh, Hebrew has other words that are usually translated life, that is, life as opposed to death, living as opposed to dead. There's another set of Hebrew words that are usually translated that way. So, nefesh is a complex idea, and, and it really has to do with the source of life, what makes a person alive. And so, you can understand how soul would be a, a legitimate piece of that, an aspect of that, but it's not. That is to say, it's not all. It's not enough to speak of the non-physical part of us because our, we are alive as God intended us to be in a way that includes physicality and bodily processes. God intended human beings to be body and soul together. And this word nefesh encaptures the whole thing. And so if heart is the very core, the very, well, heart <laughs> of our person, personality and identity, 
then soul, this second circle out, uh, is the idea of everything on the outside that makes us alive. And so it's talking about our body and the bodily processes that keep us alive and functional in the world. And so then we have a case now where he's saying, love the Lord your God, love Yahweh your God, express your devotion and your commitment to your God with not only your inner workings, not only with your thinking and the choices that you make, but also with the way that you use your body, the way that you treat your body, the way that you use your life. And so we start getting in the external realm here. So we're moving from the very core of who we are internally outward, so that we're moving from inside out, so that we've kind of encompassed the whole person at this point. You see, you following Jesus and being a Christian and being in a relationship with the one true God is all-encompassing. God is not after half-hearted devotion. God does not accept half-hearted devotion. You're either in all the way or you're out. And that is the call for us is to give up our lives to this God, to devote ourselves to Him and His concerns and His uh, will and His desires. And so uh, this, this fundamental call for the people of Israel and ultimately for all of us following Jesus is everything that we are devoted to God, everything that we are, all aspects of our identity, everything that makes us who we are, is meant to be dedicated to and an expression of love for God. So, are you using your body, are you using your emotions as expressions of love for Jesus? That's the call and that's the question here. Where we go from here, if these two terms really could, by themselves, encompass the whole of our person, what's this? All of your strength. Now this is where translation gets paraphrastic, because the Hebrew is just weird for this last element. This last piece that is usually translated as strength, the Hebrew word that's used here is is actually, and I'll just give you the, the uh, English letters for what it would be. This is pronounced ma'od, ma'od. And ma'od is normally, in Hebrew, an adverb that we translate very. That's weird. So he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your very. That's weird. Let's just acknowledge that that's weird. And so let's, let's uh, recognize here the complexity of Bible translation. How do you bring an, that over into English in a way that makes sense, that communicates? What is the point? What, what is he saying here? And why is strength the word that's used? Well, I can actually tell you that pretty clearly. And it has to do with the New Testament and the way that we see it in Mark's gospel, gospel, which we're going to take a look at in just a second, very briefly. So strength is the word that's chosen there because of the New Testament. So what, what's the idea here? What's the point? Well, I think what he's saying is that you love the Lord with your God with all your heart, all that your, is inside you all your soul or life, everything that you are, externally and internally, together. And then finally, he comes around and says, love the Lord your God with everything that you have, all your resources. Um, one of my favorite movies still is um, the, um, the recent adaptation of Alice in Wonderland, live-action adaptation of Alice in Wonderland that Disney produced several years ago, early 2000s, I guess, maybe close to 2010. I should have looked that up. Um, but I love that movie for several reasons, but one of them is the, that Alice, at one point in the movie, says something to the effect of, um, she's having a conversation with the Mad Hatter, and the Mad Hatter is, uh, questioning her courage, her, that he's not like he remembered her from when she was younger and he knew her. She was brave, and she'd go try anything, and now she's pulling back and saying, I can't do what you're wanting me to do. And 
he accuses her of losing her muchness. Muchness. I don't think you'll find that word in an English dictionary, but I sure think that's exactly what this word in Hebrew is trying to communicate here. Love the Lord your God with all your muchness. Uh, and the idea is everything that you have, everything that makes you strong. And so strength is appropriate here. And so that would include your money. That would include your resources. That would include your property. That would include your citizenship in a nation like this. That would include your freedoms and responsibilities. That would include your family. That would include your relationships. And so the question then and the challenge then comes, are we using all of those things as expressions of our love for God, our commitment to God, our devotion to God? The call is that everything that we have would be given over and used as an expression of our love for Him, not for our own benefit and our own pleasure, but as devotion for Him. Now, we're running long here, so let's uh, just glance over at what Jesus does with this uh, greatest commandment in Mark's account. So in Mark chapter 12 gives us uh, this conversation that I alluded to earlier, so that Jesus uh, is being has been asked, what's the greatest commandment? And this is, he responds by quoting this verse and then adding Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. So Mark 12, verse 30, quotes this verse, Deuteronomy 6, 5, and says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now notice what happened there. Did you catch it? He said, love the Lord your God with four things, with four things, rather than three. Right? The Hebrew has three, heart, soul, strength. Jesus adds a fourth element that is the word mind in Greek. What's happening here? Has Jesus added to the greatest commandment? No. He simply brought out what is implied in this term in Hebrew. You see, what happened in thought development, and I'll just do this briefly, but uh, by the time you come around to the New Testament period and you come around to Greek philosophy and Greek ideas with a Greek language, they actually developed a separate, independent concept and word for the thinking processes, the mind. Uh, Hebrew doesn't actually have a word that's rightly translated mind, that's separate from the word we translate heart. Uh, it doesn't have a word, but Greek does. Greek has the word cardia, like we get cardiology from, that we would translate heart, that refers to the blood pumper. And in Greek association, Greek metaphorical extension, it starts to refer more to the, uh, to the feelings and the emotions like we think of now in modern Western society. So much of our thinking is rooted in Greek uh, philosophy and Greek thinking, uh, even today. And so it is that as cardia, the heart, the physical blood pumper, was used as an extension of not only uh, the, the mind and the emotions, but they developed other words that would refer to the thinking processes and associated them with different aspects of our personality. And so uh, the Greek word is dianoia in this particular case, and it is the normal word for mind that refers to rational thinking and intellect. And so what we see happening is Jesus and, and Mark, as he translates whatever Jesus said in Aramaic, probably, uh, he, that he makes explicit what is implied already in here. He hasn't added anything. He simply brought out more clearly in Greek what was there in Hebrew all along. And so the word heart in Hebrew, lev or levav, uh, refers to the, the thinking and the feeling, or at least the thinking and the choosing. And in Greek, it is, you, have, you need two separate words to communicate that. Now, most of the time in the New Testament, because the New Testament writers are so shaped by the Old Testament, and they're Jews, most of them, um, and even Luke the Gentile, when he uses the word heart, very often you can see he's using it in an Old Testament sense. He's using it to refer to the thinking. He's, he, you'll read phrases like, the thoughts of the heart. And so he, even Luke the Gentile, but 
all of the New Testament writers more broadly typically are still thinking with an Old Testament Hebrew mindset as they use the word heart, and they're referring to the heart as the seat of the thinking rather than uh, using the terminology for mind. So, where does this take us? Well, Jesus, of course, just brings this greatest commandment over uh, to us, ultimately. And so, it's valid for us to look at Deuteronomy 6.5 and to examine it the way that we've done and to apply it directly to ourselves, the way that I've tried to raise these questions, these diagnostic questions. We ought to look at our lives and we ought to view them through the lens of the greatest commandments. Now, in hearing these greatest commandments and, and in analyzing our lives, surely, if you're anything like I am, you, you're going to see areas where you're not there. You're going to see areas where you fail. You're going to see areas where you're still holding on to things for yourself that you haven't really given over to God. You're going to see areas of your life where you are sinfully and selfishly utilizing what God has given to you or even aspects of your own personality for your own benefit, your own pleasure, without any respect to God or what He wants for you. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that that's normal. And that's a part of the Christian life, is identifying those areas where you are not wholly following Jesus with everything that you are and everything that you have. The call to us as Christians today is the same that it was in Jesus' conversation with that with that man who asked the question. The responsibility on our lives, the call on all of our lives, is that we would love God with everything that we are and everything that we have. And we, out of that love, we would love our neighbor as ourselves. And so instead of focusing our attention on using our resources and using who God has made us to be, our gifts, our skills, our proclivities, our personality quirks for our own pleasure, our own benefit, our own use, we would turn them outward in gratitude to God and worship of God, devotion to God, but also to help our neighbor and to benefit them. And so I ask you, is that what you're doing? I don't want to burden you by focusing on these commandments with a feeling of guilt or a sense of uh, overwhelming responsibility. What I want you to remember is that Jesus died to purchase the, the good life for you. Jesus died to purchase a life that does this. And that means, in part, that Jesus died to pay for the ways that we fail to love God with all that we are and all that we have. Jesus died to pay for the ways that we fail to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so when we recognize, when we evaluate ourselves, and we recognize areas of our lives where we are not wholeheartedly, whole personally following Jesus and committed to Him, don't despair. Don't throw in the towel. Simply acknowledge it and own it. Own it and recognize and enjoy the forgiveness that's been won for you by Jesus. He died to pay for our failures, to live up to the greatest commandments. And so, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to examine yourselves. I encourage you to look closely at what God is uh, expecting from you. But rest at the same time. Rest in the salvation that's been offered and extended to you, the forgiveness that's been purchased for you by Jesus, it is overwhelmingly significant and sufficient to cover all of your failures in these areas. But then when you recognize that you're failing, when you recognize that you're weak, when you recognize that there's some half-heartedness in some of your life, in your devotion to Jesus, repent. Admit it. Own it and turn away from it. That's the normal Christian life, folks. We admit when we sin and we turn away from it because Jesus has died and Jesus has risen from the dead, victorious of all, over all that causes us to fail in this life. And so I encourage all of us to maintain this perspective that says, this is my number one priority, to love God, to love my neighbor in these ways. Nothing in my life, nothing of my resources, of my possessions are off limits. They are all 
from God ultimately, and they now need to be all to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for calling us to a wholehearted devotion. We thank you that your son modeled this for us, that he lived a life of a man who was fully devoted to doing what pleases you all the time. He used everything that he was. He used everything that he had to honor you. Would we follow in his footsteps by the power of the Holy Spirit? Would you help us to rest in the forgiveness that's been won for us, not to wallow in our guilt when we recognize our failure to measure up? And Father, would you help us to grow in our love, in our devotion, in our commitment to you? Whatever parts of us are not are not being used for your glory and for your honor, would you help us to repent and help us to devote ourselves fully to loving you, to loving our neighbor, and to seeing great fruit coming from that life. Thank you for calling us to follow Jesus. Thank you for enabling us to walk by faith. We need your help to live this life fully devoted to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.